again for being with us. God bless. God bless you. Thank you for your beautiful worship. It is a gorgeous day to be in the house of the Lord. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. God is here. You're here. It's a beautiful equation for his greatness to be demonstrated among us. Rustin, Sterling, families, online family, we're so glad that we're piping into you guys today and we're thankful for that beautiful merger kind of thing that happens that we can't see but you guys see and uh, we're so thankful that you're joining us today. All of you here at uh, the West Monroe Broadcast Campus, thankful for you. Listen, before I get in the message, in the lobby, if you haven't uh, seen Ray, April Rogers, one of our own, her, her brand new 30-day devotional, 30-day walk with Mary and Martha. Listen, we need to stay connected, we need to stay plugged in, and these kinds of resources are made available to us, and we're grateful for the gift in April. And um, so stop by there, pick one of those up, and it'll be a blessing in your life uh, as you go through that. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter one, Ephesians chapter two, I'm really excited about tomorrow. Tomorrow's a landmark day for me. I turn 65 years young tomorrow, y'all. Come on. Woo. I'm officially young enough to be on Medicare. That's awesome. That's a good part about it. Uh, you know, we're all aging. We're all at different stages of life. We're all at different places in our age brackets. We're all getting older. Um, years ago, author, humorist, Irma Bombeck, and if you recognize that name, you might be old. Um, but she wrote um, an article entitled, You Look Wonderful is an Awful Compliment. You Look Wonderful is an Awful Compliment. She says, I've reached the age of, you look wonderful. In my 20s, it was, hey, what's up? In my 40s, it was, hey, what's going on? These days, it's, you look wonderful. There's just something about you look wonderful that I don't trust. She says, the greeting's the same whether I just rolled out of bed or just rolled out of the recovery room. They always say, you look wonderful. And I say, compared to what? They give me a nervous laugh or a playful punch in the arm. Nobody ever explains to me what they mean by you look wonderful. Why do I mistrust this compliment, she writes? Because I use it myself. Automatically, when I see somebody over 50 years old, my lips say, you look wonderful, but my mind says, what in the world happened to you? <laughs> she writes, continuing, a few years ago, I was at a birthday party for a woman who was 97 years old. She looked like an inflatable doll that had sprung a leak. <laughs> Without exception, everybody hugged her bony shoulder and said, you look wonderful. Quite honestly, she looked terrible. She continues to write, last year I attended a funeral and the same people who hugged me said, you look wonderful, and turned to the casket and said, doesn't she look wonderful? <laughs> but what are the alternatives? You look interesting would work. Or you look like you're trying would do. Or you look better than I thought you would. Anything but you look wonderful. And I look out at all of you amazing people today. I just want to tell you, some of you look really wonderful. <laughs> Others of you look interesting. And some of you look like you're trying. Uh, but I love you anyway. And what matters is young or old, God is here. And we're all here, regardless of our age. And I'm thankful for that. Anybody thankful that we're all here together in the presence of the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to talk to you today from this title or subject, this idea of the normal Christian life. Not the subpar kind of normal like, no, I'm talking about what a Christian life should look like, the normal Christian life. You ready to get in the Word, say amen? amen. I'd be hard pressed to have a biblical, spiritual conversation with anyone without landing on the discussion of, of the lifestyle of a Christian and coming face to face with this idea of faith and works. Faith and works. What exactly is faith and what does it have to do with works? Aren't these two biblical concepts like oil and water? I mean, do they really somehow flange together in the Word of God and become applicable in the life of a believer? At first glance, this phrase from Romans 1 and 5 seemed to be almost out of place and it doesn't seem to set well with many modern day Christians. Now, if you're a modern, I know we're living in modern times, but I hope you're not a modern Christian. I hope you're a normal Christian. There's a difference. Romans 1, 
Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes through faith for his namesake. To the obedience, calling all the Gentiles. I'm guessing most of us in the room aren't Jewish descent. Maybe somebody might be. But most of us are Gentile believers. He's calling all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for the sake of Christ. What's Paul saying? That faith and obedience are inseparable, that disobedience reveals the absence of true faith? Is he saying that genuine faith as it was once delivered in the gospel cannot exist without obedience to the gospel? Most of us have been confronted with similar questions if only by our own thoughts and musings Is it possible for somebody to be a Christian and not live the life of a Christian? Is it possible to have saving faith without ever evidencing any connection to a spiritual walk with Christ? Is a person a true Christian if they never pray, never read their Bible, and never make any overtures toward obedience to God's word and to the heart of Christ? Jesus said in Matthew 16, all the synoptic gospels, if anyone desires to come after me, to follow me, let him deny himself. So I say deny himself. Deny himself. Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now, I'll just tell you what that word, take up your cross, meant in first century Christianity. It meant death. We wear crosses dangling from our ears. Some people do, I don't. Uh, some people wear them around their necks as ornaments. But I want to tell you, it was not an ornament to be worn in Jesus' day. A cross meant crucifixion. It meant death. And Jesus is speaking here. It means death to yourself. But the the truth of the matter is, in the first century, if you name the name of Jesus, you were probably signing your own death warrant. How many thousands and thousands of Christians were slain and crucified and and their blood drenched the soil and sprung up in the early church and every time they were persecuted, more believers sprung up. Jesus said, let him deny himself. Take up his cross, die to himself and follow me. What what do you say about a man or woman who claims to have accepted Christ early in life but now has, has absolute zero interest in the pursuit of the things of God? Are they really truly born again? First of all, True faith is not a mental acknowledgement of the truth. If salvation consists of just acknowledging that God exists and believing that Jesus is the Son of God, believing that heaven is real or hell is real, then every demon is a believer. James wrote in the whole context of faith and works, how it balances in James 2 and 19. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror but no demon's on his way to heaven. Even though they believe that, they, they, believe that, they believe in God the same way I believe in Alexander the Great. I believe that Alexander the Great was a military genius, that he assumed the throne of Greece at, at 20 years' age after his father. I believe that, that uh, he, he died of malaria at 32 years of age, but I've never met Alexander the Great, and I certainly have never bowed my knee to Alexander the Great and said, I am your subject, you are my Lord, you say what you want me to do, and that's what I will do. I have never done that, neither will I, See, for many to say they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, it may mean nothing more than the demons who also believe that Jesus is the Son of God because they will never bow their will. Don't let me lose you. They will never bow their will, their intentions, their desires. They will never bring them under subjection to the one they claim is their Lord to worship him. What's the difference in what I believe about Jesus and what the hordes of hell believe about him? See, saving faith is more than just a mental affirmation of historical truth. As a matter of fact, there are people filling churches across America today and around the world who have made a mental assent to the historical fact of Jesus Christ. They signed a card, walked an aisle, repeated a prayer, shook a preacher's hand, joined a church, you name it, but their lives don't reflect the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. They, they checked a box, and that was the end of it. Did that, finished that, satisfied her, got everybody happy. It's the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that leads us to obedience, to the obedience 
that comes from faith, as, so, as Paul so powerfully wrote. I think it would be a safe statement that would apply to all of our lives today. We need evidence that comes in this form of obedience from our faith. Faith produces right living. Faith produces a right walk. Faith produces obedience. I'm always amazed at these polls taken by the Barna Group. and They ask questions like, are you a Christian? And you know, it warms your heart to see how many people, how many, what the huge percent of people they, they ask, they do these surveys with say, yes, I'm a believer. But they're smart enough and wise enough to do some follow-up questions just to kind of clarify what kind of believer are you? And so they say, do you believe, the, do you believe in the, the absolute authority of Scripture? And the numbers, when, when they ask that question, all these people who say, I'm a believer, the numbers just plummet. They go to the basement. Because, oh, there's a lot of people who have bought into some fallacious doctrine that says, I'm just going to pray a prayer. I'm going to go live my life and do what I want to do. And that's the end of it. When the reality is, faith produces obedience in our lives. They say that they're a Christian and only a fraction of them believes that the word of God has any authority over the way they live. So they pray to prayer, but there's zero change in their life. They're still living in the same sinful relationship they were living in before they prayed the prayer. Let me just, can we talk a little bit? still living in the same sinful relationship they were living in. They're still treating their neighbors in the same audacious, ugly, mean-spirited way. They still kick the dog, cuss the cat, and scream at their wife, and beat the kids, and lie on the report, and you name it. No, true faith produces a change in our hearts and our lives. Come on, can I get an amen on that this morning? John wrote in 1 John 3, teaching us the obvious difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. Look at this in 1 John 3, 10. So now we can tell who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. That's pretty straight up. Does that mean that a believer will never sin, never fail, never transgress, never rebel against the will and purpose of God in his life? No, absolutely not. It's one thing to live your life with a desire to please God and to live a righteous life. It's, it's one thing to pursue righteous living and to miss the mark as, as you make that your aim. It's a completely different thing altogether to claim Jesus as your Lord and yet exhibit zero righteous desires to ignore God's righteous standard as he lays out in his word and have nothing to do with the claims of Christ, nothing to do with the word of God and somehow say, I'm a, I belong to Jesus. He'd say, no, 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 it's obvious. Just look at their life. For those who claim to know Jesus Christ but continue to live with zero resistance to a life of perpetual sin, I challenge you, as Paul wrote to a largely rebellious group of believers at the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, the message paraphrased Bible, test yourselves to make sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out, he says. So what does a life of transforming faith look like? Saving faith is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. It produces personal repentance. It produces obedience and forgiveness and the hope of everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And listen, thank God he did it like that because we'd all be running around breaking our arm, trying to pat ourselves on the back and say, look at all the good stuff that I did to earn my salvation. What did you do? No, no, all the good that we might ever affect in life, all, you can be the greatest philanthropist that ever lived. It won't get you off the ground when the Lord comes back for his church. You can do a ton of good things. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ and are you conforming to his word? Good works are not the condition of salvation. They are the consequence of salvation. In other words, we live right our actions are right, our response to God is right, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. And then it continues with this in verse 10 of Ephesians 2. For we are God's masterpiece. 
He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things he planned for us a long, long ago. Faith is an internal spiritual reality that produce, produces external physical results. Faith is the attitude, good works, or the action. So when Paul writes in Romans 1 and 5, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. He's referring to a prompt and willful action, a decision on our part to act out and to live out our faith. Paul can't imagine anybody ever saying, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm just never going to obey him. Don't expect me to obey him. Or, or, uh, or, yeah, I pray to receive Christ, but I'm not changing the way I live. I like the way I live. Well, then... That's a horse of a different color. Paul can't imagine that response, probably because of his own encounter with the Lord on the Damascus Road. Maybe you remember, he's going to Damascus with papers on his person, authority to bring Christians, authority from the high council to bring Christians bound, hand and foot, back to Jerusalem for imprisonment and persecution, maybe even death. And on the way, he encounters the Lord. A bright light came out of heaven, blinded him, knocked him off his beast of burden, and, and, and the voice comes from heaven, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? The voice came back, I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting? And you know, the, the very next statement from this man's mouth who was going to kill and maim and, and imprison uh, believers in Jesus, the first words to the risen Lord revealed the change of his mind, the repentance of his heart, and the evidence of his genuine conversion to faith in Christ. He simply said, what do you want me to do? There's an action tied to his faith. See, that demonstrates the heart of a person who's truly been converted to Christ. What do you want me to do for you, Lord? And if you continue to read Paul's story, he's ultimately called and commissioned by God to preach the very gospel that he was trying to extinguish to the non-Jews he hated so much from this man who by his own confession had been a self-righteous Pharisee all his life, whose faith, the, the faith had, who before faith had been birthed in his heart, would, would, he hated the Gentiles. When he walked through the marketplace, he'd pull his robe around him close so he didn't have to touch or rub up against one of those filthy Gentiles. But for his conversion to Christ through faith, he would walk, wake up every morning and offer thanks to God. Thank you, God, that I was not born a Gentile. Now, after his conversion experience, he says, my faith in Christ has revolutionized my life. I can't wait to tell every Gentile I meet about the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This man is completely changed. He's a totally different individual. Even his name has changed. Total, radical life change. This same Paul would later write to the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You could probably quote him. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. This was so beautiful about the retreat ministry that we all love and appreciate. People, we have, we have 50 plus men and some of their families joined them this morning at a friend church in Shreveport that we relate to, and they went over to take the retreat ministry as a missionary response out of what God has done for us and help export that. We've done that in, in three different states and locations, and, and we're thankful for that. But the, the, why, why is that? Because there's a noticeable transform change mind. People have an encounter with Christ. Any of us perfect? I don't think so. But our lives are definitely reoriented to the things of God. Has your faith worked its way into the marketplace where you live and work? Are you the kind of Christian who looks for an opportunity to share it? Or is your faith your best kept secret? What an amazing change in the life of this great man, the Apostle Paul. The normal Christian life should be punctuated from obedience to the gospel. Not just a profession, a verbal profession that lands on the floor, but an obedience to the gospel that we claim to embrace. Here's the second thing 
A normal Christian life should be a faithful relationship with God. We were created for fellowship. You remember in the, in the very creation that God would walk in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve and have, have great fellowship. Jesus didn't die to save us from the chains of our sinful past to watch us languish and dry up and parched in a, in a place devoid of his presence. No, his presence is everything. His presence is real. His presence is for us. He, he, sent his, he said, I won't leave you comfortless. I will come to you. How are you coming? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. We were created for relationship. We were made to commune with him, to enjoy his presence. That's, that's an astounding thought that God seeks fellowship with the likes of me, with the likes of all of us. That's a beautiful thought. When intimacy is broken, it's not what he ever wanted. It's always the result of our choice. Our choices are what breaks fellowship. Lay your hand on your chest and say, my choice but our relationship with God sometimes resembles what one fellow said about his relationship with his wife. He said, the secret to our long marriage relationship is we take time to go to a nice restaurant two, two times a week. A little candlelight dinner, some soft music, a little dancing. She goes on Tuesdays, I go on Fridays. <laughs> Don't try that. No, the Lord wants an intimate relationship with us. Here's another characteristic. It's a spirit-controlled life. How many professing Christians are living with Christ in the vicinity, but not with his indwelling presence controlling the very lives that they live? We've often prayed, Holy Spirit, fall, fr maybe you prayed today, Holy Spirit, fall fresh on me. But what we often mean is Holy Spirit, fall somewhere near me. I want to experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my immediate vicinity. I just don't want God all up in my grill. I, I want God in a measure that I can control, but not to allow him free and complete reign in my total life. I'm not really sure I want to change that much. This, this, that's what we want. Let me tell you what God wants. God is not content with only partial control of our lives. He will either be Lord of all or not Lord at all. He wants to be dominant in every arena. He's not happy with us having a supernatural experience and calling it good. The spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-controlled life means that Christ is at the core, at the very center of all that I am, that every arena and area of my life is completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit's control. God never is content to be a muted, neglected, guests confined to an upstairs bedroom or to the periphery of our lives. Stay over there, I'll call you if I need you. He's never gonna live like that. He's never gonna occupy a vessel that puts those parameters or boundaries on him. He wants to be front and center, living, pulsating, walking with us every day of our life. Everywhere we go, the Holy Spirit precedes us and people know it. I think it was Pastor Ryan just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week, used the passage out of the book of Acts where the, the, the Sanhedrin court saw Peter and, and, and John, and they, they knew they had been with Jesus. They recognized they were ignorant and unlearned men, but they knew they had been with Jesus. Oh, God, please let me, wherever I go, that people can see something different about my life. And they won't say, oh, he'd been to the casino all night. No, they're going to say, he'd been with Jesus, man. Anybody want that for your life? I want people to know I'm, I'm a Christ follower. I don't want to hide it. I don't want to put my light under a bushel. I want people to know I am fully devoted to Jesus Christ, and he is the, he is the absolute Lord of my life. Here's a warning. We can become so accustomed to spiritual barrenness that we no longer realize how desperately we need a fresh infilling of the Spirit of God. Octavius Winslow, Winslow said, it's an alarming condition for a Christian when there is more knowledge of truth than experience of its power, more pretense in the profession than holiness and spirituality in the walk. I just gotta tell you, when you're living a spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-controlled life, it will be obvious to everyone around you. They won't have to guess. That's why you see them, they tell them a filthy joke and you walk up and they change the conversation. 
Spirit-led life affects our thought life, our actions, our motives behind why we do what we do. It impacts the way you treat your neighbor. It changes the way you treat your spouse and your children, your coworkers, your employees. It affects the way you present yourself in the public arena. We were eating at a local restaurant and the waitress was really sweet. It was a, in the conversation, she found out that I was a pastor. She said, Lord, I gotta get my life right. I'm coming to your church. I'm gonna bring my brother and his kids. We all need to get back in church. I'm a, and, and Come on, somebody, that's beautiful, isn't it? Thank God. And then, then she said something that shocked me. She said, Pastor, you got swag. <laughs> you got swag. <laughs> what she really meant was, you look wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> For a 65-year-old. Another characteristic of a normal Christian life, the, the, the normal Christian life is recognizing God's voice. The prophet Jeremiah, speaking for God, gave this amazing invitation in Jeremiah 33 and three, and he said, he said this, call to me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Psalm 32, eight through nine, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Don't be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and a bridle to keep it under control. Let God guide you. God intends to speak to his people. Jesus said those who were his sheep would recognize his voice. And another voice they will not hear. But tr the tragic possibility exists in all of us that we can become so accustomed to the voice of the world and all the clamoring and buying for our attention until the voice of the Lord is drowned out among the clutter. Listen, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody else. We got everything, every kid got music, you got a whole library in your back pocket. You got every kind of music. There's two, three billion songs on Spotify you can listen to. You, you got some kind of XM radio in your vehicle. You get in, it's, it's got some, something going on, talking to you. You got three televisions in your house. I, I, I know what I need to do. So, so often I just get on that evening news and boy, I'm gonna tell you, I, I need to just cut it off because Listen, televisions are expensive and bricks are handy. <laughs> and I don't wanna be buying a new television. That's how it frustrates me sometimes. I get all my blood about to boil. And I don't, I don't give anybody the what for, but I wanna tell you, I'm thinking some thoughts in my mind. You got about as much business being in that position, you know, whatever. Who told you you're a financier? Who told you what the interest rates ought to be? Come on, somebody, y'all, don't sit there and act like y'all are uh, pious and holier than I. Please, it's frustrating when we try to communicate with people who either don't hear us, aren't listening, or simply aren't interested in what we have to say. Ever thought about how God might feel when he's trying to talk to us in a hundred different ways he's speaking to us? But so often we're simply not listening without even being conscious of it. We blow God off. We hear every other insignificant droning voice while we silence the voice of the preeminent one and give zero response from our end. It's a real bummer when you're trying to join a conversation but you can't get a word in edgewise. You know, you've been in those, just talk, 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 talk. I'm thinking, if you'll just pause, catch a breath, I'll jump in because I want, I want to say something. But they don't ever catch a breath. They got endless air. I don't know, you got an oxygen tank, somebody. <laughs> the, the only ones that get the floor is the ones that shout the loudest, right? But God's never gonna shout. He expects that those of us who are his sheep will have ears to hear just the slightest. Will you say, Lord? I said, I believe that God wants to speak to us. I believe that God will speak to you and can speak to you. And you can be driving down 7th Street and the Spirit of the Lord can speak to you. If you're tuned in, he can speak to you. Say, take a left. Go down to this house, fourth house on the left and go knock on the door. I believe, I don't know, a divine intersection, a divine appointment. Maybe we didn't see it coming, maybe we didn't know it was gonna happen, but God can set up some divine appointments. He can speak to you and say, you're thirsty, get up and go get some water at the, at the coffee bar at work, and when you get there, this woman at the well who desperately needs somebody to bear her soul to finds you a full, spirit-filled believer, and all of a sudden, she unbears her soul, and you lead her to Jesus. But we gotta hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Let me say, some of you in the room today, even if you don't believe in Jesus or you're just kind of on the fence about God or maybe you believe in Jesus, you're just not sure he believes in you. Open your mind. Open your life. Set your heart free to believe. 
Because I, I can get you to taste and see that the Lord is good. You won't leave here the same way you came in. Anybody testify to that? It will mess you up because the rest of your life, no matter how much fun you think you're having, going out with your friends, doing hungover, shooting up, doing all that stuff, you'll be in the middle of it and say, this ain't as good as Jesus. Because Jesus is the best thing that this world has to offer. He's still the best thing that the world has to offer. And if you're living a life of faith in Jesus Christ, you will never be able to calculate or estimate on earth what the effects of your faith will be. Again, Paul says in verse five, we received grace to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. I imagine they read that letter, they looked at each other amazed, but here we are still talking about it 2,000 years later. You see, the impact that you're making by your vibrant testimony, by your bi vibrant faith, by your obedient faith, the impact in that fifth grade class or that special needs child that you're loving on or the kid on the football team that doesn't have a parent being raised by his grandparents or, or, or that coworker on your floor or that lonely person that you befriended. You have no idea what kind of impact you're making by simply being obedient to the faith that you possess in your life. And it will take eternity to add it all up so that the Lord can give you the reward that you're going to have. All that attitude of obedient faith in play, Paul writes, that our sphere of influence will continually increase. And just like Paul desired for them, and as God desires for us, ultimately, the name of Jesus Christ will be honored, his name will be magnified, and the cause of Christ will be advanced when we as a body of believers reorient our hearts and minds to the things of eternal significance. And set our affection on those things that produce righteousness, holiness, beauty of Christ in our lives. It's an old course that highlights the power of these two elements, faith and obedience, trust and obedience. It simply goes like this. You gotta be looking really, really good to know this one. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy. Don't raise your hand if you know it. We wanna identify you as old. To be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust him with your life and obey his word for your life. And if you will do those two simple things, man, the world is waiting for you. The beauty of knowing Jesus is at your fingertips. You won't find it hard to get up every day and thank Jesus for the day that's ahead of you and say, Lord, I'm your servant this is the day you've given me. Point the way. I'll, you just tell me what to do, Lord. I'll go do it. Tell me what to say, God. Give me, some, give me some moments where I intersect the path of somebody who's hurting and needs somebody who's full of faith. And you'll watch God take your life. Sometimes we can look at our life in the mirror and look at ourselves in the mirror and think we're not too much to offer. But when the Spirit of God filled your life, you became a powerhouse to affect change in God's kingdom. Amen. Bow your heads with me right where you are. This is the most important moment of the day. This is a place where people make decisions. So unless you're one on the serve team and need to get to a place of service, I just ask you, just remain quiet and still just for another moment. Some of you in the room today, you know you're not ready to meet the Lord. We, we read and hear of tragedies happening all the time. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't sell fire insurance faith, but the reality exists. Used to people my age and beyond died of heart attacks. Now they got people 30 years old dying of heart attacks. People falling out with aneurysms. People, crazy instances and accidents and car wrecks and farm equipment falling on somebody and you, you can name the dozens and dozens and dozens of ways that people depart this earth but usually death doesn't make an appointment it just shows up if we made an appointment we'd schedule it try to be ready for it it just barges in unannounced I just want to tell you today as Paul wrote Examine yourselves to be if you're in the faith, to see if you're in the faith. Make sure, test it out. 
Some of you here, you've never made any overture toward Christ. You've, you've, maybe you've come to church, you've come with your family, maybe you, you showed up with a friend today, or maybe you just happened in, or maybe you've been here for years and years and years. I, I want to tell you, today could be the best day of your life. You would just simply say, Jesus, I need a Savior. I, I'm sick of the way I'm living my life. I'm sick of living in sin. I lay my head, though everything seems to be good all around me, I lay my head and get still at night and I see the sin played out on the movie reel of my life. And, my, and I recognize, Lord, I need you. I need a Savior. Again, nobody's looking around right now, but somebody in this room today is here because God ordained that you be here for this moment. Would you just be bold enough to raise your hand and and say, Pastor Tom, pray for me. I want to get, I want to get my life right with Jesus today. Come on, hold it high. Let me see. Hold them high right there in Sterling and Rustin. Thank you. Keep them up. I just want to see who I'm praying for. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Others among you who have known the Lord, you've seen his power, you've lived his grace, and yet choices have led you astray, and your faith is cold, and your relationship is, is inactive to say it best. And you need to renew your heart for Jesus. You need a personal revival of your faith. Are you here right now and you'd raise your hand? I, I'll put both my hands up because I think everybody in the room should raise your hand. Come on, where are you? Raise your hand, let me see where you are. Jesus, help us, God, thank you. Pray this simple prayer with me, would you? Uh, everybody who raised your hand, everybody who didn't full voice, all campuses, pray it with me. Lord Jesus. I believe you're the son of God, that you died to save me. You rose again on the third day. You're coming back for people who are anticipating your return. Today, I give you my all. Not just in my words, but my life I lay before you. I make you the Lord of my life, Jesus. Thank you for loving me, for forgiving me, for saving me and giving me hope beyond this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's celebrate what God